Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, good evening, everybody, or for anybody that may be listening in from the States, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Webinar Vet for inviting me to this type of CPD. I really like webinars. I really like the fact that it uh, connects our community in ways that we couldn't do 10 or 15 years ago. So on behalf of Dr. Attila and myself, thank you for welcoming us to this type of presentation. As Bruce said, I am currently sitting in uh, the wonderful tundra that is Nebraska at this time of year in the United States, where it is currently minus 17C. But thankfully, I am wrapped up in a blanket in my flat. So quite happy to join us from a war, join you from a warm environment. You are stuck with me and Aelin for the next three hours, but we, again, are very, very proud and feel privileged to be able to spend that time with you. To make this topic a little bit more digestible, we have broken uh, this seminar into three parts. Part one, we'll talk about preparing and stabilizing your GDV patient in the emergency room before they hit the operating theater. Then Dr. Attila will spend time talking about the surgical management of this life-threatening condition. And then we will conclude our three-hour session with post-operative considerations. So with that being said, let's get into the nitty-gritty of gastric dilatation and volvulus. I've always been taught, and I have started to pass this down to students, that if one were to look in a dictionary for quintessential life-threatening veterinary emergency, they would see some depiction of gastric dilatation and volvulus. Historically, mortality rates have varied from about 25% all the way to approximately two-thirds of affected patients. But thankfully, each year we get better at what we do as a profession, and with aggressive intervention at this point, we're able to keep that mortality rate down to a reasonable 10 to 15%. Obviously, we would all like that to be zero, but realistically, that's not likely to happen for a wide variety of reasons. Of course, gastric dilatation and volvulus has to involve some degree of distension of the stomach with both gas and anything that the animal has ingested, whether that be liquids or uh, solid food substrates. There also has to be some degree of malpositioning of the stomach along both of its axes. And we know common synonyms that uh, are found with our good friend Dr. Google and Dr. Bing and Dr. Yahoo, which in my opinion should all have their medical licenses revoked, are bloat and torsion. And we need to uh, be sure that when we communicate with pet parents that uh, we understand some of the terminology that they may be using to describe this condition. So I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing the pathophysiology of this condition so that we understand realistically why we need to intervene the way that Dr. Attila and I are going to advocate. Remember that a key aspect of the stomach rotation that happens in this condition is that the pylorus moves from right to left. And I remember this being a national boards question here in the United States, and it's one that seemingly most critical care specialists and surgeons do uh, pound into the brain, so to speak, of their students. So how does this right to left movement happen? It does this by rotating first ventrally, then dorsally, and ultimately to the right. So if you view an affected dog from the backside, from the rear, this is a clockwise rotation of the stomach. 
the stomach fundus moves to the right, and the spleen actually can also move from left to right. Occlusion of the pylorus and also the cardia results from that malpositioning of the stomach. Interestingly, we do have a chicken versus the egg question in this disease process. Does dilatation happen before volvulus, or does volvulus happen to result in dilatation? We don't know the answer to that question right now, and uh, it remains to be seen whether that actually makes a difference, but it is a, it is a question that was always posed to me during my training, and I still think about at times when it comes in, when you're trying to figure out ways to prevent this type of thing from happening uh, in a patient who's not yet had a gastropexy. Again, it seems common sense, but this condition requires stomach accumulation with both gas, fluid, and or ingesta, and ultimately, you are dealing with a functional obstruction. Remember we talked that looking at the dog from the rear, essentially we are dealing with a clockwise rotation of the stomach. But the degree to which the stomach rotates is variable per patient. It can be a quarter of a turn or it can be a full 360 degree uh, volvulus. When that volvulus happens, we obviously are now dealing what in critical care is termed obstructive shock. So remember we talked about gastric distension. Well, that distension compresses the caudal vena cava and potentially even completely obstructs it. That's important because without this blood returning to the heart, our cardiac preload is very, very poor. And that significant reduction in preload ultimately results in a concurrent reduction in cardiac output. We all know that blood being pumped from the left ventricle to the body is freshly oxygenated by passing through the pulmonary system, and if there's not as much oxygenated blood being pumped from that left ventricle out to vital capillary beds, there's not going to be as much oxygen delivery. And reduced oxygen delivery to tissues, by definition, is shock. So again, we know that there are multiple types of shock, septic shock, hypovolemic shock, this specific example is a classic case of obstructive shock. Because that stomach gets so distended, we also see a cranial compression of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is essentially pushed cranially, and therefore an affected patient cannot take an adequate tidal volume breath. The need for oxygen has not changed in that patient, however, and therefore to compensate for an inability to take a tidal volume breath normally, affected patients are frequently tachypnic. So just to review that, gastric distension will change the gastroesophageal angle. And if that angle change is severe enough, which it often is in affected patients, the GDV patient cannot eructate. It can't burp. So that's one less avenue for gas to escape from the stomach. Combine that with the fact that the stomach has rotated along its long axis, to induce a state of duodenal compression. And so now the exit hole, so to speak, 